we might get started. Um, so I'm going to open with an acknowledgement of country. So State Library Victoria acknowledges the traditional lands of all the Victorian Aboriginal clans and their cultural practices and knowledge systems. We recognise that our collections hold traditional cultural knowledge belonging to Indigenous communities in Victoria and around the country. We support communities to protect the integrity of this information gathered from their ancestors in the colonial period. We pay our respects to their elders past and present who have handed down these systems of practice to each new generation for millennia. Welcome to the second ANSMAPS webinar for the year. Thanks for joining us for our student showcase on making sense of place through personal connection to location. I'm Sarah Ryan, ANS MAPS committee member and senior librarian at the State Library of Victoria. I specialise in Victorian and Australian collections, including MAPS. So we're fortunate to have a couple of RMIT students with us today, Helen Simpson and Joanna Gardner, as well as their lecturer, Amy Griffin. So um, the students are, are from RMIT in, in Melbourne and they're all studying geospatial science. Unfortunately, one of the students who was to be joining us today, Erin Kaletsis, uh, is unfortunately unwell. So Amy is um, going to speak to, to her presentation. So well, without further ado, we'll introduce our first student, Helen Simpson. And Amy, Dr. Amy Griffin, uh, will we'll say a few words to introduce both of our speakers. Um, so I'll give the floor to you, Amy. Okay, um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Sarah. Um, apologies everyone for my daggy hotel room in Vietnam where I'm currently sitting, uh, but uh, anyway, um, I'm really, really excited uh, to give these students the opportunity uh, to tell a wider audience about their work because all of them are doing really excellent work and really fun and interesting projects that involve maps in one way or another. And I will do my best to do justice to Erin's talk um, in, um, in presenting her work since she's not able to be here. So our first speaker this morning is Helen Simpson. Helen is an about to graduate uh, bachelor's student. Um, who's going to be talking to you about a project she did for her honors work this year. Um, so it's a very interesting project looking at some historical material and how we might be able to help people better understand what an historical experience was like for the person who experienced it uh, in a place. Uh, so with that, I will zip it and let you uh, hear from Helen herself uh, about that very interesting work. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just share my screen. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see that and they will yell out if they can't. So we can see it, but it's not in presenter mode. Good. Perfect. Yep. Beautiful. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'll be speaking on my RMIT Geospatial Science Honours Project that I did this year, which uh, was kindly supervised by Amy and involves connecting emotional experiences to location using maps and to Your sound has just dropped out there, Helen. Yeah, I also can hear her. She seems to have frozen. Well, that's Helen. Um, if you can hear us, you might want to try perhaps switching off your camera. I might try perhaps stopping Helen's camera for a tick.
what we might do until we can get Helen back um, is perhaps move on to <laughs> our, our next speaker, perhaps. Um, Joanna, um, would you? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Yeah, okay. That's go. So okay. I'll go back to you, Amy, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing Joanna, and then we'll, yeah, we'll get back to get back to Helen. So. Uh, the, the vagaries of uh, internet connections <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> where you can live in a major city and still have not good internet. Anyway, I'm sure you all have felt that pain wherever you are tuning in from. So um, I'm pleased to introduce Joanna. Um, Joanna is a PhD student. Uh, she is, uh, she's getting close to the end um, of her work. So she's got a lot of interesting things to share with you. Um, she's also a lecturer at Swinburne University in her day job. Um, the PhD is moonlighting for her. Um, and she's working really at a very interesting intersection of art and cartography. Um, so you're going to see both sort of artistic and scientific perspectives, um, as well as the perspective of a designer. Uh, in her work. So I will now let her tell you about it. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll share my screen. Um, can everybody see that? I'll just move the attendees out of the way. Excuse me if I've got a bit of dry mouth, but anyway. So hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Joanna Gardner. Thanks Amy for the introduction and Sarah as well. Uh, my PhD is looking at perceptions of place, which is an interdisciplinary approach to mapping through scientific cartography, design, and artistic expression. Um, let me just click here. But before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the lands on which Swinburne's Australian campuses are located. These lands have always been places of teaching, learning, research, and design. So as I started, yes, we're looking at perceptions of place, which is this interdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary approach to mapping through scientific cartography, uh, design and artistic expression. And this research investigates how mapping can be used to bring depth and meaning to places by utilizing a combination of diverse influences and responses, including emotional, sensory, memory and imaginary. So by exploring cartography through the overlapping of these distinct fields of scientific cartography, design and artistic expression, this study challenges and questions the tipping point of when a map ceases to be a map and becomes art. And this is a little diagram created initially, always a work in progress for the PhD, but kind of looking at that tipping point between scientific cartography, how far can you expand mapping before it's maybe no longer considered a map or becomes art. And that's also part of an underlying question for research that I'm looking at. We're starting with a basic, the PhD is divided into five main chapters. We won't look at all of them. But the first initial one is looking at perspective and where this research has started from. And because it is this interdisciplinary approach, um, I've been also creating these diagrams to look at, at which points in the process of mapping do these different disciplines come together, go off, explore, do more research, and then come back again. Um, in a nutshell, because we don't have a lot of time, so bear with me if it's uh, all condensed, but just to talk about scientific cartography in a nutshell, it effectively and efficiently communicates spatial information. It generates propositions. It constructs meaning from that information. For artists, they disrupt order, create their own rules, or discard them altogether. And for a designer, they're a key communicator in any given field. Uh, they can determine the most appropriate visual or graphic representation based on the given information. And they've also got a responsibility to adhere to a brief and comply to a set of rules while communicating their objectives. So the first project that I started with at this PhD was looking at the local uh, neighbourhood park, which I would go walk through every day. And I mapped this park, the Edinburgh Gardens, which is in Melbourne, Australia, um, in Fitzroy North for a year, over the course of a year. Each time I would go, I would document it through photography, sounds, uh, sensory maps, collected objects, and recording the route through a Map My Walk um, application, which would show where I would go during these park visits. When I gathered all that information, I would go home and start to collate that. And me coming from a design background, that would be this idea of a brief, taking that information, putting it together and trying to make sense of it all. 
So looking at my roots, what was the weather like that day, the date, what time of day was it, um, through those photos as well, generating colour palettes, and then also with the collected objects where they were found. And it was quite interesting with all of this information to just start seeing how we could really get a sense of place through visiting the same place over and over again over the course of a year and how that might change. Um, so it was looking at experience of place apprehended through the senses, emotions and intellect, which is all fundamental to perception of place. So here are some of the recordings of the weather, showing the map my walk, which would show the routes, how long I would stay in a particular area as well, which we'll, you'll see leads on to the next um, section. These were some of my um, base maps that I would also take to the park just for those sensory notes that you can't necessarily always document and you don't want to forget. So what did the wind feel like? The smells? Did I get a, you know, shiver up my spine because it started raining? So all of those things I would try to document in addition to all of that other information that I was collecting and the data. These are some of the comparative photos as well from when I would first enter the park. And you can start to see already just through comparing those photos from the same location, how that sense of place already changes when you're entering into it. Looking at landmarks or something, as I would walk, there were certain trees or the sky that would grab my attention. And after a while, you'd realize they actually became your landmarks that you would visit each time. Looking at the changes of the sky, again, always from a particular location, seeing the garden beds come and go and grow looking at the, the wetlands there, how that would also change, even the textures of a particular tree over that point of time too, looking at how the moss um, would come and go and the shadows and the light. Also with the collected objects, there were found objects, but they could have also been natural objects. So they objects that were discarded behind, rubbish that people had left, lost objects, but also nature too also gave that sense of where we are, what time of year it is. Um, these were some of the other objects collected. So these were just each time I'd come, get my little bag, collect these, and with all the other information, start exploring what that next step might be. So these were some more comparative studies. And then some of the roots of the same park, removing the base map and just looking at how they would overlap. And you could start to see immediately that I actually ended up having a particular route. I might diverge every now and again, but you would keep going in that same route. Maybe it was because... I was getting tired of going every couple of times a week or every day, you know, um, but it was nice to actually find that you would have that route to be able to go back and, and compare and analyse how that place would change. So this is the brief. So as I said, I'm coming from a design background and I was looking at these alternate notions of the brief, um, which would be for a cartographer, their specifications, and maybe for the artist, their imagination. And you can start to see with some of these other little smaller examples, those colours, how the time of day would actually really shift and change your perception of that place. I know at night time, you're there alone. It's, you're not as comfortable as where then when it's sunny or on a weekend, it's full of people and activities. So the park was constantly evolving and changing. And through that, after doing it for a year, time was the main key thing that kept coming up over and over again, how time affected one's perception of place. So this interdisciplinary study has shown the effects of time on perception of place while contributing to the field of cartography by offering up new approaches and ways of thinking about mapping. And also the transitory nature of time informed the mapping prototypes that investigated ways of mapping time. Mapping time. So I was looking at this uh, spatiotemporal, uh, <coughs> excuse me, spatiotemporal map, uh, space time cubes, which show an individual's walking path, like the ones you could see from the bird's eye view of the map my walk, but actually introducing that notion of time and stretching that out so we can see how long you stayed in one particular area where, you know, if there was a moment in time where you were just stationary, you would see that. So I wanted to find a way of working with this notion of the space time cubes to bring that time element into the mapping prototypes. So with those objects that were collected, I created a cabinet of curiosities, essentially. Each of those uh, contained all the objects that were found on a particular walk. And the next step was, what am I going to do with this information, with all that other information too? Um, and I created these space time cubes out of ice where I would embed all the objects as well as filtering, adding certain colorways that came into the brief, 
And the reason for the ice is that it, it is ephemeral mapping, just like time and just like every single visit at the park. So as the ice would melt, just you would be left with the objects that were left behind, just like one person's visit to the park and where they've left their objects behind. And so we created a series of these space-time cubes, again, weaving in those colours, weaving in um, the objects as well, and then documenting those, which are actually have become a stop motion animation later on that you could see. Uh, freshly cut grass, the smells, trying to capture that too. Um, and, and just sit, looking at ways of being able to, to do that yeah, through the ice. Uh, so these are some of the full space-time cubes, some are part of the series, and then showing how over time they melt and we're left with what's, what's left behind, which is how I found these objects in the first place. These are details as well, looking at some of the details of the objects, the colours and creating these time slices. These are actually large-scale graphics um, that were printed out. Um, and this is another series of those details of them. There's also a film with a stop motion animation, um, which I won't play now just based on time, but you can see that the exploratory mapping exercises developed for this first project, they captured my own subjective personal experiences and gave a deeper look at my own changing perceptions of place. And it quickly became apparent that in order to expand upon this research, I needed to involve more people in, and participants into this study. So while we were looking at time, the next thing that came up with the participatory study was emotions, because that was the next thing that was affected by the different times of day, the seasons, who was there and all of that. So with the emotions, I wanted to bring in that participatory study. So it explores the perception of place and the representation of that shared perception through mapping and the data collected in this participatory, participatory study informed an emotional map of the park that examines one's emotional connection to place. So we're on to the second chapter now, or third, we've got perspective, time, and now we're looking at emotion. So with the participants, I gave them quite a thorough um, uh, re, um, booklet to go and look at three different areas um, of the park. So these are people, locals, um, who uh, anonymous, who decided they would do this three-part survey. Uh, it was able to generate different points of view through doing this and look at those shared experiences, synergies of the different uh, participants, and also examine how people perceive or move through and understand place and their own emotional connection to it. So the, initially we would get them to do, well, these are a couple examples. I'll just quickly scroll through those. This is just the beginning of the participatory uh, survey and part one. So there were three parts. The first one was memory. Um, this was titled A Walk in the Park. And with the memory, we asked the participants through this survey uh, to just explore their experiences and their emotional connections to the Edinburgh Gardens and recall a particular experience or event and why that was significant to them. Um, were they with people? Were they alone? You know, all of these sorts of questions. Again, big data, how do I sift through that? Looking at strongest, vivid most vivid memories, smells, sounds, or particular events that may have taken place. Did the time pass quickly? Did it pass slowly? Um, and ask them to do a memory map as well. So this was someone's interpretation. They did a little watercolour of a memory map. The second part was looking at their experience. So I asked the participants after doing the memory part to actually take this booklet to the park and document it in real time as they're going through the park. So they're more conscious of what's going on um, as they take that visit. So this was uh, a walk. So this was a free map that they would draw of their walk in the park on that particular day. No rules, just blank paper. <laughs> so you'll see there's a few different variations of that. Also had smell and sound notes and asked them to rank it from, you know, very unpleasant to very pleasant colorways as well what kind of colors did they notice well in this one obviously a whole array of colors um, and then if there were any objects of relevance that stood out how did they feel when they were in the park in, in this case engaged happy content how long were they there over an hour and then a bit more descriptive uh, about you know other observations or thoughts that they may have had and then the final part was a reflection so once they created their memory gone or their memory uh, and then gone to the park, had this experience and documented that. I wanted them to go back and reflect on that. So 
uh, looked at how the weather might have contributed to them actually choosing to go on a walk that day. You know, how did that compare to their most recent memory or the memory that they had documented? Um, also creating another reflection map, just like with part one, this person chose to do a word map, which I thought was quite lovely too, you know, inspired by Richard Long, who wrote as he walked. And then um, I gave them a base map of the Edinburgh Gardens with no information, just the zones. And I actually found with all of this other information that this is where I could really start to compare all of those uh, experiences that the participants had. So these marked um, specific areas in the park, deeply associated with their own individual stories, events or experiences. Um, just some demographic information and so forth. And then I've also asked them to document it through Map My Walk as well, or an equivalent app, so that we could actually see that data. Uh, also the weather, just like I had done. And um, the next step was then coding that qualitative data with the words and visuals, because as you would know, anyone who's working with qualitative data, sometimes it's really difficult to know where to begin with all that information. So I started by sifting through, finding keywords that would keep appearing. And I used in vivo to code those words and to kind of create these different categories based on the information that was provided to me. Looking at their um, maps that they had handed back, I could compare their colorways with the little graph that I'd given them to have a look at. So I could see how they may or may not be similar. Uh, looking at their memory maps. So again, looking at comparing all of those individual memory maps. I tried putting them together to see if there was something happening there that looked a bit like a dog's breakfast. I quite liked it, but it didn't give me much information to go with. And then these were some examples of experience maps as well. So those blank pages where they could just go to town and, and draw the map how they felt as they were walking. So these are a few more. Again, looking at the overlays. And then the reflection maps as well. But then finally we get here, which were these base maps. And what I found here is where that information linked with the other information that they had given in terms of how they were feeling, the times of day, I was able to start to use those base maps and these zones to compare. So again, oh, this is where the overlay actually did work as opposed to the other ones, which were, um, and you could start to go, oh yes, there's density happening here. So when I actually did start to overlay more, I could start to generate these zones. And based on the in vivo data, which had created categories of you know, happy or content, sad or reflective, all these words, they were also color coded and I could start to overlay those. And what I ended up with were these individual, once you remove that base map, these zones, these emotional zones of the park and each one of these maps is an individual's own participatory you know, experience of that park with the colors linking back to their emotions at the time. So these were some of the individual um, maps participatory motion maps. And then overlaying them is where you could really start to see that density. So, so since many of the emotions overlapped, I was able to explore layering, transparency and the implication of solid colors versus translucent. And because emotions are in a constant state of flux, I decided that transparency or layering was essential in terms of capturing and shifting that state of emotions was flexible that needed to be accommodating for this transitory nature of these emotions and the map should be layered like showing that complexity of those infinite range of emotions that can attach themselves to place. So these were some of the colorways with the shared emotions just pulling apart all of those emotions and just looking at them individually. Happy and content obviously the the winner here at the Edinburgh Gardens but it was quite nice to actually see that but how can I get more of the layers? Because I think when it was all flattened out just in 2D, you lost that sense of the shared experience. So this was the next stage with the prototyping of the mapping. It was to look at it. And I looked at it through motion. So motion through motion felt like a way, since we aren't stationary in the park and we are moving around and we're constantly having a range of emotions from one to another. I wanted to explore that further. So inspired by Alexander Calder's mobiles, I uh, created a little prototype with one of the participatory maps um, and looking at that idea of fluid movement and that variation of the shifting colours as one moved through the park. So that was the idea behind the mobiles. I tried taking that further from the paper to like laser cutting clear acrylic with acetate prints. 
uh, using the illustrator, which I'd used to generate those um, maps based on the information from the base maps, use that to kind of further apply, apply UV printing with some of the textures and the colorways that linked back to those emotion categories uh, and generated one mobile and tested that. Still wasn't quite working for me exactly the way I wanted to. So the next step, I went to this idea of that transient journey. So yes, the motion, but let's just see how we can get more of that transient journey here. So this idea of morphing um, these emotions into their shape, as quickly as they would take shape, they started to begin and transform into the next state of emotions um, and eventually becoming this kind of fluid, unseen archipelago of emotions. So here, this is a motion graphics piece. I think we'll probably play at the end if there's no technical difficulties just in the background. But the idea is that those feelings as one walked through the park is constantly shifting and changing um, until their end at the very end with their base map. The next step was looking at liminal emotions. So that state in between. And I came across the dichroic film, if anyone is a, knows that dichroic film, where you can hold it and as you walk around it, the colours are actually shifting based on that material. So I wanted to explore that further. Um, so I created these plates with the different emotional maps and looked at how that dichroic film could, could create that sense of change, which is what I was looking for with that idea of the transient journey as well. Um, created another mobile based uh, with the dichroic film. And because they were temporal, motion was just one way of evoking those senses of those ever-changing and shifting emotions. The transition of that change from one emotion to the next, or in some cases, they show multiple emotions at the same time in the same place. So this was the idea with these um, mobiles. And these are some examples of how the dichroic film shifts just subtly as you're moving around it. So uh, this was a, I wonder if this will play yet. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that, but there is, you don't need to hear it, but it gives a sense of how those mobiles move. All right, oops, we go down. Um, so that was one, looking at that mobile. The next was what came up was this idea of the emotional Petri dish, which is where those maps, when I took those participatory maps, when they were just in their 2D form, using that acrylic and those colours to start to bring density and pull apart those layers and those individuals. So we can still see them collectively together, but also individually. So I explored these... Um, little petri dishes is what I decided to call it. And you can see that all these individual slides reveal each participant's emotional map together in this collective view. And the layers give a deeper and kind of ever-changing map of these emotions. So these are all of the individuals uh, stacked together. And you can see also, oh, sorry, back backtracking, the, the, the shape of the gardens is actually without that base map starts to appear all based on those emotions that those people have generated in those zones. And I also found it interesting, I think it will come later on. Oh, this was also the density looking at the sides as well. You could start to see how those colours, which led me to actually separating out all of those um, different emotions again. These were examples with the uh, dichroic film giving that subtle shift. And we're going back here. So this is where I took those slides um, showing the density of the areas within the park associated with those particular emotions. So we could see that yellow, happy and content was the winner. We could actually see that now stacked one with the volume and the amount of colours, but also then how they worked together as a whole. So we have a few of those. And then again, having a look and comparing those different emotions in a different way. So what came out of that was that one, emotions are integral to how one understands and constructs perception of place. Also the place triggers memories and that these memories are directly linked to specific events connected to place. And these specific events generate particular emotions. 
And each experience is layered with emotions based on past experiences and knowledge. And finally, together, these emotions shape one's perception of place. So the perception of place is complex. It's multi-layered and highly subjective. And emotions are integral in how one relates to, understands, and constructs perception of place. So to finish off, <laughs> I'm trying to do this a little quick as I can in the time we've given. This research, and I'll play this is with the morphing in the background, but this research uh, examines effect, uh, the effect of perspective, time and emotion, and that what they have on perception of place and the depth and meaning that we attach to it. In addition, it demonstrates how the cartographic sciences, design thinking and artistic expression can inform one another to spark new ideas and generate new ways of thinking about approaches to cartography. Furthermore, it illustrates how the different disciplines engage with and understand space and place, interpreting the same information in ways that are unique to their areas of specialization. Ultimately, these disciplines work together to generate our perceptions of the world around us. And by exploring cartography through the overlapping of the distinct fields of science and art, this study challenges and questions the tipping point of when a map ceases to be a map and becomes art. So there we go. In a nutshell, um, this is where I'm at. So I'm um, on to the next stage of mapping prototypes now. But um, just wanted to say, uh, let's see. Thank you for listening. I hope it wasn't too long. Thanks so much, Joanna. No, um, that was not too long at all and okay. really, really fascinating. Um, and there will be time, we'll have um, Helen's presentation and um, we'll have Amy talking to Erin's uh, and then we should have time for uh, some questions relating to the presentations at the end. I, I certainly have some questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but um, what we might do uh, is we might uh, go back to, to Helen um, and... Um, listen to, to her presentation. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, her power went out, but um, she's, she's back online now. So um, Helen, we will pass over to you. Yep, thank you, Sarah. I just can't do my video again for some reason. Um, ah, okay, I'll um, see if I can help out with yeah. that. Helen, your experience today reminds me of a time during lockdown when I was giving a lecture and um, my internet kept dropping out and then finally the power went out. So. Oh, yeah, it was just momentarily a power outage, but the internet went out as well. So yeah, had to reset. You made you a co-host now, Helen, oh, so good. you might be able to. Oh, no, I still can't. I, I can just okay. press on without it. That's fine. Okay, apologies. That's all right. Okay, I'll just share my screen and go again. Hopefully I get um, 20 minutes without the power going out again. Yeah, <laughs> no, go, go for it. Uh, Time's not a problem. No worries. So start again. Um, so good afternoon, everybody again, and thank you for uh, listening. And I'll be speaking on my RMIT Geospatial Science Honours Project that I did this year, as I mentioned, was kindly supervised by Amy and uh, involved connecting emotional experiences to location using maps. And to illustrate this process, I'll be using a case study focused on an Australian World War II pilot in Bomber Command in the UK back in 1945. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Bomber Command, it was the UK's airborne bomber force used in World War II and pilots and crew often were only in their late teens or early twenties. And they came from the UK and other allied countries. So just going on to the next slide. Um, so for today, I'll be going over the background to my project, the data that I commenced with, how I extracted the emotions from the pilot's experiences using sentiment analysis, how I constructed my maps and some of my learnings. So I basically commenced my project with two things shown here. My father's diaries, his old diaries, you can see here on the slide, from his time as a pilot in Bomber Command in World War II. 
And then this small box shown up here on the right, which when we opened it up, contained all his old RAF maps and it detailed some of his bombing routes undertaken from the UK to Germany. So you can see the, the very old maps there. Um, the task for me was to extract his emotions from these diaries, which were written in quite hard to read cursive script and connect these emotions to the locations he was at on several maps. So the main purpose I had was to demonstrate the emotions contained within lengthy historical narrative, in this case, a diary, could be extracted from the diary and expressed on a static historical map to give the map user a richer experience than that gained by the narrative or the map alone. And my task was basically to extract emotions from the diaries, design a bespoke historical map akin to those times and express those emotions on a map in the locations in which they occurred. So Amy introduced me to sentiment analysis, which I'd never seen before. And basically by running an appropriate program, using that you can extract emotions from bodies of text by comparing sentences and words to what's called a stored data dictionary. And then the words in that text can be categorized into various emotions. And in, in this case, um, you can see on the left there, uh, eight emotions such as joy, fear, and anger, and whether the emotions from the sentence are positive or negative emotions. So I used R software to run the sentiment analysis, which by using some basic coding commands can extract and categorize the narrative into eight basic emotions. And shown here on the left-hand side of the slide is the code that I used to analyze some of the diary narrative and the emotional classifications that the words from that narrative fell into. That is, um, if you can see it um, in detail, there are one meaning that a particular emotion occurred in a sentence and a zero reflecting that an emotion wasn't experienced in a sentence. Now, I'm by no means a strong coder, but I did manage this process quite easily once I was given a demo by Amy and I was able to create um, some bar charts on the right there, which uh, helped me to extract the dominant emotion. So I analyzed 13 different events from the pilot's diary. Um, the events consisted of 11 bombing raid operations, uh, one of the pilot's times on leave from England to Scotland, and finally the pilot coming home to Australia. And the dominant emotion of each of the 11 bombing operations is shown on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, firstly, showing surprise in the pink there on the pilot's first bombing operation with what he saw. Uh, but that surprise very quickly converted into a trend of fear. You can see in the yellow there, um, once he realized the danger involved and what was required. Uh, there are some brief periods of anticipation as his dominant emotion shown in the green. Uh, because there are some rumours at that stage of the war ending. And you see on the very last um, uh, section there that uh, the war actually did end. So there was a lot of anticipation around that period. Um, you can see that there are other emotions dominant alongside, um, you know, for example, the anticipation. You can see a lot of anger in red and maroon occurring alongside other emotions. And that was basically due to the pilot's plane being fired upon by German fighter planes. Uh, so really, in general, I did find that sentiment analysis was a good method to extract emotions from a long body of text. Um, there were some issues with slang and historical context. For example, the sentence in the diaries, when we got hit, apparently, since we have found by our own flak, the word found is associated in the data dictionary as joy when obviously that sentence is not about joy in, in any shape or form. Uh, just moving on. So for constructing the map to show the pilot's emotions, I used ArcGIS Pro and I geo-referenced the old map data to get the exact flight path. And through the generosity of other academics known to Amy, I was able to obtain information on old country borders as well as having access to a map color picker to appropriately color code some of the emotions. Uh, the coloring of emotions I found was quite critical to the look and feel of the map. For example, expressing anger in a red or maroon color was better than a color like blue, which could create quite different associations for people. And the main challenge in constructing the map was how to express the pilot's emotions from the sentiment analysis to provide quite a rich experience and interesting story for the map user. 
And there are many ways that this has been done in the past. For example, the colour coding of streets or areas in cities or countries has been used to express different emotions people feel whilst in those streets or areas, perhaps um, associated with short bursts of narrative as well. Uh, alternatively, people might have seen interactive story mapping, which has been done using software su such as ArcGIS story mapping, where things like narrative photos and videos and maps can be linked and interactively walked through by the user. Uh, but basically what I decided to do was use three methods to convey the pilot's emotions on the location he was at, which entailed firstly colour coding his emotions, and secondly the inclusion of his supporting diary text, and lastly the creation of a historical map feel um, using a static map more akin to those times. So here's one of my final maps showing one of the bombing operations undertaken by the pilot. And as you can see, I've used many facets to convey the emotions on the map. For example, the flight path in from the UK, uh, full Sutton right across to Germany Witten um, is coloured yellow to express the fear felt as uh, the 20 year old pilot and his six crew hurtled their way over to Germany in a huge Lancaster bombing plane. And on the way back again, um, you can see that I've used both red and yellow. Uh, there was still a lot of fear associated that, at that stage and anger also at the plane uh, being extensively hit upon by German fighter planes. Um, in turn, the people in those German fighter planes were of the same age, you know, young, young 20 year olds um, basically facing each other, which is quite sad. Um, the map is dark to portray the plane takeoff time of midnight and also give the impression of the harrowing nature of the situation. Um, I've located cities and towns across the flight path to demonstrate the fear that possibly would have been felt by occupants as um, the formations of thousands of thousand plane formations flew over. And I've found that in showing people this particular map, they're most interested in where the flight path was because they perhaps traveled to or, or lived in these cities and can imagine what it would have been like when all those planes were flying over. Um, as well as including the old country borders, there's also a maroon line representing where the front line was and plus uh, where the German aircraft bases were. So you can see um, it would give an understanding of how difficult it must have been for planes flying from the UK across the front line because they go right over the German aircraft bases and how they would try to minimise loss of life in doing that. And it also gives people an understanding of why they took quite a convoluted flight path. You can see they haven't gone directly um, because they wanted to minimise or potentially minimise time over the enemy territory. And finally, I've included narrative on the right hand side there from the diary um, to give an extra dimension to the emotions felt. So whilst I've color coded them, that only goes so far. So I felt the need to actually put, put diary narrative there so you can read about um, how the pilot felt on that night uh, and, and the sort of things he experienced at his age. So the diary pages shown, I did them to reflect an old style font on yellowing lined paper to simulate the diary construction. So the other maps I designed show happier days. Um, here's a map of the pilot going on leave and he starts off in full Sutton in the UK and he travels by train and bus um, right up to Old Meldrum in Scotland to visit some relatives. Um, in this case, the colouring is much brighter and I've used coloured circles to represent the pilot's emotions in each place that he stops. In this case, you can see anticipation is represented by the green circle, joy in orange, surprise in pink and trust in blue as the pilot um, undertakes more pleasurable experiences. Uh, and the colored circles expressing emotions are in proportion to the extent experienced. For example, um, green with anticipation is, is a little bit bigger than, than joy because he experienced anticipation of his, his leave and, and the exciting things he was gonna do a lot more. And um, again, I've used diary text alongside uh, for extra information. So that's what he penned in his diaries when he went on leave. So just over to the final map. Um, this is again brighter, showing the pilot's emotions on homecoming and his ship journey. However, the map has a dark wash sort of placed over the left-hand side of it. 
um, including over the diary entry as when the pilot left England, the ship broke down and everyone was in a pretty foul mood and it was terrible cold rainy weather, a bit like last week in Melbourne. Um, therefore, the pilot's emotions on leaving England portrayed again as, as I've done coloured circles, um, this time expressed like anger, disgust, fear and, and sadness, quite dark in Europe. And um, then they change again when the pilot reaches the then called Bombay um, to joy and anticipation because the pilot and his friends get off the boat and they sample the beautiful pool at Breach Candy and food's plentiful and laid on, which it hasn't been under the rations in the UK. Uh, and then finally he stops in Melbourne and it shows the joy felt by those welcoming the pilot home and a welcome home telegram is included um, alongside the map to give an authentic feel to the map. So what can I pass on to others having done this project? Well, basically I was pleased that the sentiment analysis was appropriate for extracting the pilot's emotions from the diary text as I did have a lot of text to analyze and I don't know if I could have done it any other way. I did, however, learn that sentiment analysis should be used with some care, particularly with the narrative I had due to slang and the old terms in the diary, like even simple words like a plane in those days was called a kite and a boat was called a tub. So, um, you know, there were a few things like, like that, um, which, which were created a few minor difficulties. Uh, the main learning I had was that to express emotions on a map can require a multifaceted approach. And colouring of emotions is important, as certain colours will portray different things to users, which could also be culture or situation specific, so just to take care there. I also learnt that all parts of a map must support each other. For example, had I used a modern base map, it probably would have detracted from the 1945 times and given a conflicting message to the map user. And finally, whilst it was convenient to place emotions in particular buckets, I wanted to provide the actual narrative alongside the map to give a bit more depth to the emotions felt. So where to next? Um, well, I have another half dozen old maps where it would be good to map the flight path from those and create a set of maps, perhaps putting them together with the diaries to serve as a historical insight into Bomber Command in World War II. So thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, another really interesting and fascinating presentation. So um, I think I'll, I'll pass over to, to Amy, um, just to give us a, um, a bit of a summary of Erin's um, research. Uh, and I think, uh, Amy, you're gonna be talking to Erin's presentation slides. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try and do her work justice. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> how well I'm able to do that. Uh, let's see, let's get the right thing shared first of all. Okay, can you see that all right? Yeah, looks great. Okay, I'm also gonna attempt something I've never tried before. So we'll see if that uh, works. I'm gonna turn on the captioning for um, in PowerPoint. So we'll see uh, okay. if that is useful. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm presenting on behalf of one of my PhD students, Erin Kaletsis, who unfortunately has a chest infection and no voice, uh, so she can't really communicate very well with you. Um, I can tell you that if she had started this presentation herself, uh, she would also do an acknowledgement of country. Erin um, is herself a Bundjalung uh, woman, and she would be coming to you from Wurundjeri land. Um, so I'll say that on her behalf. Um, so Erin um, has recently had her PhD thesis examined and passed. Uh, so this was a, a, a wonderful thing. She still has a, a defense coming up because she's enrolled in a joint PhD program with the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Um, but once that is done in February, she will tick all boxes uh, and be Dr. Erin Kaletsis. So we're all very excited for her to reach that stage after a long journey. Um, so Erin's work was really about trying to understand a very particular group of map users. And that group of map users uh, is people who have really difficulty uh, in, in using maps for wayfinding and navigation purposes. Um, maybe there's somebody you know in your life uh, who one might categorize that way. Um, for me, it's my brother. 
um, who after decades of driving from my parents' house to my aunt and uncle's house could still get lost despite the fact that it was no more than three turns. So um, GPS certainly has been a revolution for him uh, in wayfinding. Um, but Aaron was really interested in why, um, why people had difficulties uh, with using maps for navigation purposes. And so she decided to study them. Um, so she set out to try to A, understand these problems and B, to think about how could we design maps differently so that these people who have trouble with the typical maps that we might use like in, in our phones these days with Google Maps, um, how could we design those differently so that people could use them more effectively? Okay, so in doing that, she had a few questions that needed to be answered uh, before she could really um, start out on her study. Um, so the first was just to understand, well, what is map literacy? And she defined map literacy as the ability to use wayfinding maps to walk from one origin to one destination in an efficient and satisfying way. So in a way that didn't cause them stress, that allowed them to get from one point to another um, in an unfamiliar context, right? Um, so that was how she defined map literacy. Um, so why, why did she wanna do this? Um, because she had, um, people in her circles uh, who, who struggled to use maps and she wanted to find them a solution uh, that would be less stressful and that would help them with this problem that we have of having to go places that we um, haven't been before. So how did she decide to measure this? Um, in the end, she decided to use a, a measure that's been developed by some psychologists uh, in the US. It's called the Santa Barbara Sense of Direction Study. Um, it measures uh, what we might call an environmental spatial ability. Um, so it measures things like um, what is your, obviously from the name, what is your sense of direction? Um, how well can you orient yourself in the environment? And in particular in environments, not small environments like within a room, but within environments where you can't necessarily see um, everywhere that you're trying to go. Right, so we can think about different scales that we experience the world, um, some of which we can see all of the things in that scale, others of which are larger, and so we can't actually see everything all, all at once, um, at least not when we're standing on the ground. Of course, if we're, um, you know, up, up in the air, we can see a bigger field of view than you can on your, when you're on the ground. So this, this measure is really um, measuring people's sense of direction at that kind of intermediate scale of what you can see when you're on the ground moving around an environment. Um, so she adopted this measure, which had previously been developed, um, but what wasn't really known, um, most of the studies that had used that measure in the past had been on relatively small um, populations and also on um, people who lived in particular locations. And so she wanted to uh, get a better sense of how much variability there might be um, in this measure uh, across a wider area. So she did a small study um, using a scientific recruitment platform called Prolific, where people who are interested in participating in scientific research can log on and participate in studies. Um, so she administered this Santa Barbara Sense of Direction scale uh, to um, about 400 people um, to find out well, what was the typical score. Um, and so uh, the, the mean score across that sample of people was 4.2 on a seven point scale. Um, so she classified anyone who had a score of four or below um, on that scale to be map illiterate. So that was the group of people she was then trying to study um, how they used maps. Okay, so what did she do uh, then? So she started with two studies um, that were kind of exploratory in nature. They were conducted in different environments so she could understand the variability in how people experience this map illiteracy. Um, so her first uh, case study, if I can get this, uh, sorry. So there you go. Um, her first case study was in a place called Enskede uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so Enskede is where Twente is located. Um, it's a relatively, for Europe, it's a relatively small kind of place. Um, I think there's maybe like 50, 60,000 people who live there or something like that. Um, so it's in, in the Australian context, that would be a 
you know, a decent sized country town, uh, but in the Netherlands, that's kind of a small place. Um, but the other thing that was uh, of interest about this location um, is that the streets there, um, because it's an old city, um, they're not laid out on a grid, right? So the streets are kind of windy. Um, you know, you can't necessarily see all that far down the street because the street turns, the street names change every few blocks oftentimes. So wayfinding there can actually be quite challenging. Um, so that was her first study location. Um, the second one uh, was here in Melbourne, where the streets, at least in the CBD, are much more rectilinear. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's kind of easier to move around um, because at least you know where the next intersection is likely to be. Um, so she did a study where that was basically observational. Um, she um, asked people to first look at a map um, and plan a route between two locations. Um, and then she asked them to actually travel um, that route. Um, and she measured what they were looking at in the environment uh, using some um, eye tracking uh, equipment. And I'll have a photo to show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, so she was also looking at the differences between um, different ways of understanding uh, the environment with maps. So in the Enskita case study, uh, she, she used a mapping app. Um, and in the uh, Melbourne case study, she used a typical tourist map. So in fact, she went to the tourist information center and asked them for the map that they give out um, to use as part of this. Um, okay, so let's see. And that's just a, a photo of what these uh, eye tracking glasses look like. So basically for those of you who have never um, come across one of these pieces of gear in the past, um, the ones that we use outside in the wild um, are mounted on a set of glasses that are, you know, they're, they're kind of like heavy sunglasses, I guess you'd describe them. They have a little sensor um, in the, uh, the bridge part of the glasses. And what it's actually trying to measure um, is the reflection, the location of the reflection uh, of some infrared light on the surface of your eyeball. Because from that, it can triangulate where your gaze is, which direction your gaze is going. So we can tell things like, which buildings are you looking at in the environment? When you're looking at the map, what part of the map are you looking at, et cetera, right? Um, so she used those to measure where people were looking. Um, she also asked people to think out loud um, and to tell you know, kind of what, what, what was going through their minds um, as they were uh, using these maps. Um, and she captured things like, you know, where they were pointing on maps and things like that. Okay, so what um, were some of the results from these two exploratory studies? Um, so the, what you can see here on this screen um, are some of the actual um, paths that people were walking to get from point A to point B. You can see that people um, went a couple of different ways. Um, at, because for almost every route you might plan, there's more than one way to go. Um, you can see a little bit of the variability of GPS um, and how it's capturing your location. I forgot to say that um, also um, their GPS location was being tracked um, with, the, with a phone app um, as they were doing this. So we could also see where they were going. Um, all right. So the key findings um, were that um, she found that when people were out in the environment, um, people who were map illiterate were often, um, they were kind of almost getting lost in the map and they uh, weren't looking around enough in the environment to actually match where they were with respect to the map. Um, and so this was part of why they were feeling so much stress or feeling so much confusion because they couldn't self-localize. Um, and even, even in cases where they have the little blue dot, uh, that many of us would be familiar with um, from these mapping apps. Um, and you know, noted that when you're in a city environment in particular, there are places where you don't have enough visibility of the GPS to really accurately locate yourself with the blue dot. So you can't just be a slave to the blue dot because the blue dot isn't always accurate depending on if there are buildings that are blocking um, your visibility of the satellite from the device, right? So it might put you uh, even you know, not really on the right block in some cases. So you do still need to have some awareness of, of where you are. <laughs> okay, um, so some of the key findings from this research. 
sorry, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so I talk about them in the right order. Um, so first of all, people often were missing those important environmental features. So the landmark at the place that told them, okay, I need to turn left here or I need to go right here. Um, and not only did that interfere with their ability to um, use the map to get from point A to point B, it also interferes with their ability to acquire knowledge about the environment to build that mental map so that the next time they need to go to the place, they have some memory of how to actually get there and how different locations relate to each other in space. Um, implicitly, we're all drawing on our mental maps when we are navigating in environments that we know uh, relatively well. You know, that's an input into us actually navigating um, effectively uh, when we're out there in the wild. Um, she often found that part of their confusion would derive from street names not being close to where they were on the map or at key decision making locations. And so I'm sure that you've, I mean, I experience this all the time when I'm navigating. When I'm looking at Google Maps, it seems to invariably never have the street name where I want to see it. Um, and that, then there's also times where in the environment, it's hard to see the street name. And in Europe in particular, in Australia, we tend to have street signs in predictable locations on a pole or on some kind of um, traffic infrastructure as you're crossing the street. But in Europe, that's often not the case. Uh, and you're hunting around trying to find where this uh, street name is. Um, she also found that among participants with lower S the SOD scores, so lower math literacy scores, um, they were often very confused about their location. And the way that they were trying to establish where they were um, was in looking for very local features, things like street numbers. Um, so I think, um, let me just go back. Uh, I know it must be on a, a map that I have coming up. Um, in Europe, you will often find that on maps, there will be street numbers actually depicted um, on, on the map. Um, that's not always a feature of maps in, in other locations, um, but they were often using that as one of their key ways of trying to figure out where they were. Um, the fourth key finding was that when these maps had overlaid public transport networks, um, this could be very confusing because in this case, they were they were or they were um, navigating by foot, right? So they weren't interested or needing to use public transport information. So it was extra kind of visual density on the map that was making it difficult for them to actually figure out the relevant information for them as a pedestrian. Um, and then, uh, so I think I've got a, a good example um, of this. Yeah. So here, oh, this is where the um, the illustration was of the. Uh, street numbers um, on that first, the study one map where you can see for each individual building, it's got the house number. Um, the example of the Melbourne map um, is showing the public transport routes. Um, and so you can see that in parts of that map, there are actually quite a few different transport routes because we have trains, trams, buses, all kinds of things going on in Melbourne. <laughs> and as a pedestrian, none of that is actually really relevant once you're already in the city. It might help you get to the city or to home uh, from wherever you are originally coming from, but while you're navigating around in that city, uh, it's often just kind of extraneous and density of visual information that makes it hard to find the most important things, which would be street names to help you get from one place to the next. Um, and then her fifth key finding was that sometimes um, the way uh, street intersections, particularly the complex intersections were shown on the map, um, they didn't really have the right level of complexity um, for pedestrian navigation. And here I'll give you an example um, from Melbourne. So her route um, was from Burke Street up to the Carlton Gardens. For those of you familiar with Melbourne, um, you have to cross this kind of complicated intersection at Victoria Street and Latrobe Street, um, which you can see depicted here on the left-hand side. And you can see that you can't, it's not just a T or a crossing intersection, right? Where you go to that corner and you can walk straight across the street. As a pedestrian, you kind of have to jog over to Spring Street uh, to get across without getting run over. <laughs> Um, what you would like to do. Um, so if you look at the map on the right hand side here, um, you can see how that was depicted. That intersection is depicted as being just a simple crossing intersection on the tourist map. And so when people would actually approach this location, they couldn't quite match with 
what they were seeing in the environment because it wasn't a simple crossing, right? There are actually three roads that come together there and kind of in a not very straightforward way if you haven't been through that intersection on foot before in, in the past. So this was also a problem. Sometimes there was too much information on the map. Sometimes there was not enough information on the map depending on uh, what was needed or relevant at that moment. Okay, so what did she do? She took all of this knowledge from these two observational studies and she tried to develop a solution and then test how well that solution worked. So these were some of the technologies that she used uh, in developing that, that prototype app. Um, so she used the, um, the Esri suite of software to build all of these bits because it had all of the needed kit uh, to, to build one product in the end. Um, so she did some modifications of the base map using the vector tile style editor. Um, she built the actual maps in a combination of ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online, and then she embedded them within an app using the ArcGIS Experience Builder. Okay, so this was what the app looked like. Um, you can see that there is uh, much less density of information, particularly when you are super zoomed out. Um, so when you are, one of the things she wanted to do in this app was to show an overview of the whole route um, when people first put in the route information, right? So that you could see the start and the finish and the relative, like the number of turns, the relative complexity um, of the route you would need to take. Um, as you zoom in, more information is revealed. Um, and I don't know, oh, she doesn't, she didn't give me any um, screenshots of, um, oops, sorry, too many buttons here, um, of what those zoomed in locations look like. But basically, um, as you zoomed in, um, she did some things like she added, um, she added landmarks of photos of what you would see from the position that you were at. So that if you were trying to look at the map, look at the environment, figure out, are, am I going the right way? Did I turn the right way? Um, am I going down the route, you would be able to do that. Um, so she added some, um, she added some uh, landmark photos. Um, she made sure that labels um, appeared at locations of important intersections. Uh, she showed the location of the user using a you are here symbol. Um, so the blue dot equivalent. Um, and she reduced unnecessary complexity. So she didn't label every single street that's on here. She labeled the streets that were relevant to the route. Um, so the street you were on and the cross streets that you were crossing as you went along that route, but not everything else. So if you glanced at the map, um, you didn't have to spend a lot of time sort of deciphering it because it was only showing you the things that were really relevant. So she tested this with, uh, I think she had in the end about 15 users. Um, they were actually relatively difficult to recruit, right? Because you can't just ask somebody, are you map illiterate? They would look at you and be like, what? Um, even if they would admit that they were map illiterate or if they recognized they were map illiterate. Um, so it was difficult to find people who met the criteria for the study. So we used a company called Askable that helped us use, um, we deployed this Santa Barbara sense of direction uh, instrument and measured how well people did on it. And those people who were below that score of four, um, we, we recruited them into the study. Um, so uh, she tested it with them um, to see how well they did. And compared to the people who were part of her original study, people were navigating uh, much less uh, or much much better uh, with the application uh, than they were with the traditional maps. Um, in that set of 14 people, there were two people who had to be redirected. Um, so basically the design of the study was there was an experimenter who went along with the participants as they traversed this route. Um, that experimenter kind of like walked behind them um, I mean, the experimenter, Erin, she was the experimenter. She walked behind them um, and didn't really interfere with what they were doing unless they went the wrong way, at which point she would stop them, um, turn them around um, and ask them to basically keep going again. She only had to do that on two cases with this, this group of 14 people who really are challenged by using these maps. Um, and that was much less frequent than in the observational studies. Um, so in that sense, we considered the, the app to certainly be an improvement um, on a typical map. 
So what were the uh, kind of outcomes of her research? Um, so first of all, she developed this way of identifying people who we might call map illiterate. Um, she found reasons why they have trouble with existing map designs. Um, and she found some ideas about how we could design maps differently to help them um, navigate more effectively. Um, she also found oh, something I didn't mention about her results. She tested this solution, not just um, with photos going one direction, um, but she also checked to see how well they could navigate back um, from that start location. And they were able to do this um, even though the photos weren't always necessarily oriented exactly the same way if they were coming from the other direction. Um, and so from that, she was able to design some guidelines um, for designing wayfinding solutions for these map illiterate users um, in terms of what kinds of information they should contain, how it should be depicted, et cetera. So there's still definitely the possibility um, for extensions on this study. There were some things she wasn't able to really do in the time constraints she had. Um, so it was hard to find people who had zero experience um, with Melbourne, um, because when she was finally, and her study was delayed because of COVID lockdowns, of course, um, because it was a study that had to be done in person. And despite being outside and outside being more safe um, for a big period of time, we couldn't really do anything um, with her study. Um, and when she was able to do it again, tourists still weren't back. So we didn't really have access to a good population who had zero experience whatsoever with Melbourne. So it would be interesting now that it's possible to find such people um, to, to try the study again with them and see uh, if there are significant differences um, in terms of how well they're able to navigate. Um, she would like to look a little bit more into what do um, people see as salient landmarks, so the things that really stand out from them in the environment that help them move, um, and designing actual optimal routes. So not just how do we show the route on the map, but what is an optimal route for somebody who has trouble navigating the environment. Um, a fourth thing is looking at label placement, where are the best places to label the map for such users? And finally, how does using that map help them with spatial knowledge acquisition? So hopefully I've done some justice to, to, the, to her work. You have at least an overview. If you have questions, I'll try and answer them, but I may also just refer you to Erin. Thanks so much, Amy. I think you've definitely done justice to Erin's research there um, and just looking at um, the the screenshot of Erin's um, app um, I just noticed how stripped down the the information was which um, made it really easy to focus in what was relevant and um, I suppose that's that's the challenge for for the cartographer isn't it um, making those choices about what to put on a map and what to to leave leave off it um, and I also thought it was interesting that um, no matter what the format of the map whether it be the uh, hard copy um, travel map of Melbourne or um, a online map through Google Maps that if people didn't have those mental maps or that familiarity of where they were, um, regardless of the format, they would they would still be confused. I certainly have experiences of traveling overseas and I remember being in Paris and um, around the Bastille and um, looking at my phone and honing in on that blue dot and um, trying to walking backwards and forwards to try and get that blue dot to move so that I would know which direction well, I was yeah, moving. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a complicated intersection, that one that you're talking about. So <laughs> yeah, so a lot of streets going in and out of that roundabout. Uh, well, look, we've got um, about 10 minutes or so to open up the floor for some questions. Um, so, um, what I might do, um, I might ask a couple of questions. Uh, if anyone in the audience is uh, wanting to sort of think about what they might want to ask, I can enable people to ask a question if they want to in person, or you can you can just try, um, type it away in the in the Q and A. Um, but Joanna, um, I might ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I'm 
interested to know uh, in terms of, of your work and um, how cartography is often referred to as uh, the union of science and, and art, what, what came first for you, art or science or was it a bit of both? Oh, oh well, well, I guess coming from a design background, does that feel like a bit of a neutral field initially? So, no, I think... Uh, um, the art or the mapping prototypes that kind of are expanding those maps towards art, they all came from the science and the data. So none of that would have existed or or been developed as they have been without having done the mapping initially, which was that data gathering and the collection and the analysis of that. So in this case, yeah, for it's the, I'd say the science and the, and the data collection and then how that revealed um you know a different ways of perceiving place yeah what I also found interesting was um those layers of of emotion um yeah. and that yeah had that emotion of, of and feeling of happiness um was yeah very um easy to see that there was a lot of happiness and I was interested about whether People are pretty happy once they're at the park because it's like mm. a nice environment or I'm sure people arrive and they're probably not very happy and then maybe being at the park a while, for a while um, increases their level of happiness. Like mm. um, I found um, it was interesting with the base maps because you would find that there were not, it wasn't, there was only one participant that actually had a totally happy map. So there were certain zones and it wasn't those reflection maps weren't specific to one event. It was just then having a look at this is the Edinburgh Gardens. How do you feel emotionally like at that point in time? Because obviously if you revisit it in a couple of years, you probably have a very different perspective or next week or you went there later in the day. And it was all very much event based. So or like location, I'm reading some of the comments were anxiety and stress if you've got little kids and they were running and it was near the road or the playground or someone else had a negative experience because every time they were there they remembered having a fight with their partner you know and it sparked all those memories and so therefore that particular log held bad juju you know so 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 it was kind of interesting to see that they were all pretty much linked to an, to events um, or a particular but then when they had that overall base map it, it it wasn't just necessarily one experience is how they viewed that those particular zones and also with the the science and the art question too I think when um, I've had exhibitions showing the work without all the data that backs it up with the PhD and research you know a lot of people will be like you know what is that or that you know see it as art but when you actually see that it's all come from information that's been gathered over a period of time from the collection of different people it takes it back to the science and then you can see that well with that tipping point you know the scientific cartography and artistic expression when you see them all together they work hand in hand but if you take it out of context without the narrative you know it doesn't have that same context if that makes sense and yeah I don't know if that answers your question no it, def okay. it definitely does um and we've got a few questions coming through um there's one for you Joanna um about how will you apply your work and in what form? Um, oh. <laughs> I'm assuming that's meaning, you know, the work that you've presented, I suppose. Um, well, yeah, what's what's next? But, well, it's still in process. There's no, um, I think, formal, like, application with this. The, the whole purpose of this is to generate new ways of thinking about cartography and new approaches to, to seeing how you can explore that. Um, I think that's where also that scientific cartography and artistic um, expression debate comes in too, because you know science would you know wants that evidence, but in art you know it is that interpretation. So so all of that's going to. I mean, again, this is I haven't finished yet. I'm I'm getting there, but that would in terms of the conclusion and where that is, I'm I'm still wrapping wrapping that section up. But there's no um, like formal application, say like with uh, Aaron's mapping. Um, the idea is just to keep evolving that and to get to have cartographers and um, when we've presented in uh, the conferences uh, it's been quite interesting just to see from the scientific cartographers who've seen that it has kind of tweaked or, or generated different ways of thinking so 
Yes. I don't know if that answers your question either. <laughs> well, um, I think that's a pretty good answer. Uh, we've got another question, um, and this was um, relating to Erin's work, but I think I've just... Yeah, I answered it. Oh. I answered it in a, in a text in a comment. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Um, what I might do is throw or ask a question um, to you, Helen, or it might more be yeah, a couple of questions, actually. Um, when Joanna was talking about um, the importance of narrative and, um, you know, when you've got, uh, I suppose, where you're presenting work and you're not presenting the, the narrative, you might be just presenting, um, I suppose, a creative element of that and that there's some meaning lost when there's not the narrative. Obviously, with your project, that narrative um, of the of the pilot um, was very important, having that 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 diary. Um, I was just interested about the source of, of that diary and how you how you came across it. Yep. Um, it was found in my dad's things after he died. Um, his second wife passed them on to me and he never showed us uh, when he was alive, which was unfortunate because having read the diary, we would have liked to ask a heap of questions about it, including all the uh, girlfriends that he had while he was over there that we never knew about. Um, so, yeah, it was just in his box of war things, uh, of which we opened after his death. Which, which, as I say, was unfortunate. But he didn't want to talk about it because it wasn't a time of his life that he felt proud of in any shape or form. Um, he wouldn't go in any marches or anything like that. He just wanted to close that off and um, progress on. So, yeah. Wow. Um, it very much made me think of um, the collections that we have at the library Helen, um, and I know that you touched base with me um, about finding some material in our collections that might be relevant for, for your project. Um, but I suppose just an observation from my point of view of, um, you know, a big reason why people come to the State Library uh, is because they, they are um, researching or wanting to find more information about a location and, and their personal connection to that location. So at the library, in our manuscripts collection, we've got diaries and papers relating to people. Um, we've got maps. We've um, got uh, sources of primary evidence, um, published books, and um, it's that combination of, of those formats and those information sources um, that gives people the richness of, of the, the stories and, and the narratives. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to um, thank our presenters um, for taking the time to, to share their projects with us. So um, to, to Helen and, and Joanna, um, and it was great to hear about Erin's project. So thank you for presenting on, on her behalf, Amy. Um, we've still got a couple of minutes if anyone's got any um, last minute questions. Uh, well, I've got a, um, Brendan White was saying, I was interested that found equals joy in the emotion mapping, but it's not a case of slang or change in language since 1940, but a poor database, isn't it? After all, someone can be found guilty, which is not joyful. So that was a response to your um, presentation there, there, Helen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, better data dictionary should be able to pick that up. There was an instance in the diary where uh, um, my, my father goes up to visit a relative who was a butcher. And so he mentions butcher in the diary and, and uh, the sentiment analysis takes that as very negative because it takes it as the butchering of someone rather than the actual job that they had. So um, yeah, I, I think you've just got to be very careful about that and um, designing a better data dictionary or having more words or whatever, and it would help. 
Yeah, I think it also goes a little bit to the scale uh, of which you're considering the context, um, because the context obviously modifies um, the meaning of the word, right? There are cases where a certain word can be very positive or very negative, depending on the context. Um, and when you take a word by word analysis, which is what that dictionary does, you lose that context. Um, and so it is something to be very cautious about as Helen uh, found uh, and was uh, in her research. And, um, you know, it's, I guess, something for linguists to think about, about how can you actually capture that sentiment effectively. Um, and certainly these techniques are not, um, I mean, they're being more widely applied, but they're relatively new. And I think they're still trying to figure some of those things out. And we just got um, one more question, Helen, for you uh, from Riaz Dean. Um, do you think extreme emotional events, for example, war, can skew the data from everyday experiences? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, Riaz, do you mind elaborating on that a little bit further? Uh, let me just um, enable. <laughs> Riaz, <laughs> just speak. <laughs> uh, just bear with me. Allowed to talk. Go for it, Riaz, if you're with us. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, was simp I was simply asking because, um, you know, um, in that example you had, um, the emotions were so extreme in terms of fear and anger, et cetera. But if you apply that to sort of normal mapping, like later on say in street mapping, et cetera, that, um, that um, um, Aaron's work did, um, it's more everyday. So how do you kind of separate that out? That, that extreme emotion, which I would have thought would really skew data or maybe not. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. Um... I think that was one of the shortcomings I felt that there was no way for me to measure the extremeness of that emotion. I could tell that it was experienced possibly a lot, um, but whether that was an extreme emotion or just a mild emotion, I couldn't tell that from the sentiment analysis. So, uh, you know, that, that's one thing that, that could be, you know, developed in the future. But yeah, you're, you're quite right there. Um, Amy, I think, might have a bit more to say on that because she's got a bit, a lot more experience than me on that. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly one, one can imagine cases where you might feel um, extreme emotion. Um, imagine that you are a person who has trouble with maps and you're on your way to a job interview and you're under a little bit of time pressure to get there and you really want to be there on time because <laughs> it's their first impression of you, right? If you rack up 15 minutes late, it's not a good start. Um, so I think that people can experience extremes of emotion in, in everyday situations, um, but you're right that it is difficult to actually measure them. And their sentiment is not the only way that one might try to measure emotion. Um, there are also devices that are kind of like, um, they function basically the same way a lie detector test functions, where you measure somebody's sweat from their skin. And that can tell you something about the intensity of the emotion. However, it's also confounded with other things. Like if you're running because you're late, you might be sweaty. So determining the source um, of that arousal is also quite difficult to disentangle. So um, there are lots of techniques out there. Um, you can also use things like EEG, which measures your brain waves. Um, but there's challenges involved in, in all of these different kinds of methods. So I think we haven't really, we don't have a silver bullet solution for how do we capture people's emotional experiences, whether they're extreme or not. Um, but we do know that they're important to people's everyday experiences of places. And I think that's something that Joanna's research um, shows quite nicely. Yeah, I think going back to your earlier question as well, Riaz, was, you know, with something like, well, you know, emotions was just one chapter along with time, perspective, a sense of place. Uh, the final chapter I'm debating, so I won't give anything away there. So watch that space. But I think, you know, all of those things, who you are, where you come from, your previous experience of a place, how you wake up and feel that day. Um, and then every every factor feeds into that. So, again, it's finding, at least with 
my research, finding other ways that we can actually tap into that and give it context and story and actually get an overview rather than just a specific event. And I think um, as where I think with Helen, you know, we're looking very specific events with very specific emotions attached to those that you can't really separate that into a, just an everyday because we're not all fighter pilots, you know, out there going through this. So, so I think it's, yeah, again, I think context is everything really um and, and and it all feeds into each other at the end of the day I don't know if that helps at all either <laughs> well unfortunately we're, we're we're out of time so we're um gonna have to wrap up but um just thanks again uh for joining us um before we end I'll just um tell you a bit about Anne's maps so um the Australian and New Zealand Map Society promotes all aspects of cartography and, and map use. Um, and members are people like me who are working in libraries, um, researchers, uh, people who um, make maps, um, map dealers, um, anyone who's interested in history of cartography. Uh, so, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this session and that we'll, we might see you at future ANS Maps events. Um, I'm just putting a link in the chat to the ANS Maps website. If you're interested, you might want to um, find a little bit more about it. Uh, and I'd encourage you to maybe consider becoming a, men a member. Um, we've also got a e-list that is open to anyone. So if you want to hear about our activities, a lot of people share to the e-list um, with anything that's sort of related to maps. So I'd recommend that. Um, but yeah, so thanks very much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and we'll see you at the next ANS Map event soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.